Please rise as you're able for the reading of the gospel taken from the book of John, chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do not ask, do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered. My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born. And for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. You know, yesterday, I believe I experienced the kingdom of God in reverse. <laughs> so let me start at the end and work my way back to the beginning. Before returning home late last night, I stopped in on the walk to Emmaus weekend. And I won't spoil it for you, but suffice it to say that they close out the day with worship. Her voice echoing around the room, ethereally reaching for her creator in the dark. A woman named Mary offered a vocal solo so touching that I was nearly moved to tears. I was supposed to be there to pray with others, so I struggled to keep it together so people didn't start running over to pray for me instead. I led them in a prayer of dedication to their Savior, in which we affirmed our intention to serve our Redeemer with our whole lives. Worship was emotional and called us forth to give our finest for the Christ we love so much. Church, would you say that worship is the heart of our relationship with God? Worship is at the heart of our relationship with God. Go back several hours earlier in the day, and I was with the youth at the Phoenix Art Studio, watching one create, each one create their own special masterpiece with their own particular flair. God has called each of us to express God's grace through our own creativity. Surely our Creator could have made the universe with no creatures that could choose to rebel against the Lord, but that's not how God chose to do it. We were formed with the divinely given ability to choose, and in one of the opening scenes of the Bible, we see God asking Adam to give names to all the animals, a creative act on humanity's part, perhaps our first one. Worship is at its most beautiful when our love for God finds its expression. Amen? Amen. That might be through paint. But it might also be in songs, or poems, or reading something that resonates with your soul, or kneeling, or lifting your hand, or joining with that same hand with someone next to you. God yearns to see what we will do to glorify God, and God is patient. Now back to the beginning. My day started with the missions committee and the youth group, who assembled in the parlor to lay out all the food that you donated these last few weeks. Later this afternoon, members of the community who might need it will come and fill their baskets so that they might enjoy a Thanksgiving meal not unlike the rest of us. I'm so happy to say that we had more help yesterday than we probably ever had. Amen? Amen. So much so that the whole task was done in about half an hour. Church, would you tell me that faith isn't faith until it's put into action? Faith, faith isn't faith until it's put into action. Now, maybe that action is being able to be expectantly waiting for a long-awaited miracle. Or maybe it's when you put your hands to a God-appointed task. We are not passive participants in the kingdom of God. Our Savior does the Savior's work, but we must be willing to incarnate the Savior's love for the world to experience it. So that was my day. Worship, creative expression, missions. Would you repeat that? Worship, creative expression, and missions. I love it when God gives me a day like that, one that embodies the kingdom of God for me so that I can see it coming. You see, the kingdom of God, say kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. The kingdom of God may be a strange term for you, especially if you haven't hung out much in churchy circles. 
If you grow up hearing that phrase, not churchy, kingdom of God, <laughs> likely the depth of its meaning has probably been lost on you in the cacophony of Christian language. So let's recover the word kingdom of God this morning. To begin with, the Bible uses the metaphor of a kingdom to explain what the reign of God looks like. In some ways, this is unfortunate for us today because we don't have too many positive examples of kingdoms today that we can appeal to, do we? Even in biblical Israel, we see that kingdoms were often deeply flawed. Those of you taking disciple and doing readings this week know exactly what I'm talking about. For example, when the people begin to wish for a king so that they can function like the other nations, the prophet Samuel warns them that they were going to be some consequences. The people wanted a king to interpret the will of the Lord for them. And God's response is then very telling. Comply with the people's request because they haven't rejected you, Samuel. No, they've rejected me as king over them. Samuel warned them that when we rely on intermediaries to interpret the Lord for us, that we would be in trouble. Earthly kings will take your children as soldiers and servants. They will require you to pay for their services. And to top it all off, they may be no more likely than you are to interpret the Lord correctly. There's a reason that the psalmist in Psalm 146, verse 3, says not to put your trust in princes. There's no help with them. History, of course, is full of examples of monarchs that were cruel, misguided, and oppressive. Like politicians in any age, I suppose, it seems difficult to find leaders who could be both effective and moral. As Lord Acton famously put it, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So why then does Jesus refer to the reign of God as a kingdom? Wouldn't the word made flesh have found a better way to express God's sovereignty to his contemporaries? The book of the Revelation to John may give us a few clues this morning. John begins by greeting us from the one who is, and was, and is to come. This is important to be realized because if God is, and was, and is coming, then that which God reigns over must also exist in the past, and the present, and the future tense. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God is among us. Praise God. Praise Wait, what? The kingdom of God is here? How did I miss it? I woke up this morning, my alarm went off, I ran out the door, I rest required rehearsal, I got here late. <laughs> like, where, when did I miss the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God can be hard to see, sometimes. The book of Revelation goes on to say that Jesus is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him one day. The kingdom of God exists independently, alongside the created order. Just as we may have trouble seeing Jesus for the first time, or at least for the time being, the kingdom of God can be kind of hard for us to see. Jesus describes the kingdom of heaven in Matthew chapter 13, verse 33, as like yeast, which a woman took and hid in a bushel of wheat flour until the yeast had worked its way through all the dough. I personally thought this was an appropriate metaphor this morning with the bake-off going on. <laughs> Even in our present world, the kingdom of God is serving as a catalyst, like yeast, for creation's very transformation. Sometimes, if we're watching, we catch a glimpse of it. When people work together for the benefit of strangers. When young folks spend time with their elders. When older adults stoop to encourage a child with a smile. When someone has the courage to dig down deep and to forgive the unforgivable. When human beings who have suffered retain the courage to still hope. When we witness the kingdom of God when a person is healed. And when communities find good reason to stand united in love. But I have to warn you, the kingdom of God doesn't work the way that most kingdoms tend to work. For one thing, the kingdom of God has at its head not a fallible human being, but a God who is trustworthy and consistently good. Hallelujah? Hallelujah. This is a hard thing, I think, for us to believe, because we haven't seen a whole lot of that in our world, have we? But God is worthy, you see, of our trust, and will not steer us wrong. Amen? Amen. I think part of the reason we fear putting our trust in Christ is that we worry that by doing so we are somehow giving away our security. The way that we worry in this country about giving away our guns and giving up our Second Amendment rights because we worry that an invading force might take away our freedom. This is not the way it is with God. We might later ask ourselves, I think, what if God turns on it? But God won't be corrupted by power because God, you see, has always held the power. All of it. There's nothing you can give God except for your love. God already has all the other cards. 
Fix the environment? Done. God speaks and it's done. Stop the violence? Sure. God could break the bows, snap the spears of the war in half, and knock the bullets right down to the ground. Make everyone live a happy life where they have everything that they ever wanted. Yep, not a problem for God. But doing these things means that God would need to revoke the one thing that God has always preserved, and that is our right to choose. So putting our trust in God, you see, doesn't really give God any more power than God already had. Our Creator wants for us to have full creative license with which to express our love. God's kingdom, you see, works differently than other kingdoms. When Jesus was arrested and dragged in chains and then questioned by Pilate, he asked Jesus if he is the king of the Jews. He wonders what this man has done that his own people would turn him over for execution. And Jesus responds, my kingdom doesn't originate from this world. If it did, my guards would fight so that I wouldn't have been arrested by the Jewish leaders. My kingdom isn't from here. This is one of my favorite responses in the scriptures. You see, Pilate is confused because his understanding of a king is one who is followed by others in conquests that expand the kingdom's resources and protect the kingdom's assets. Not the least of the assets of a kingdom should be the monarch themselves. So if Jesus is a king, why do his followers not rise up and fight? Jesus is trying to clue Pilate in to a biblical truth. My kingdom doesn't work the way that yours does. Roman rule was deemed the Pax Romana, or the peace of Rome. That rule was maintained by a Roman boot that trampled kingdom after kingdom, and the Roman spear, which pierced the hearts of anyone who threatened the kingdom's security. Jesus' kingdom, however, doesn't originate from this world. Church, please remind me, it isn't from you. Jesus' kingdom has its source in the sovereignty of God, who loves all that God has called them to be. After all, everything of the created universe was created and called good by God, except for humanity, which the Creator called very good. Sisters and brothers, you and I are created very good. And so God isn't concerned with God's own security, or the security of God's kingdom. There are no outside threats to the kingdom of God, or the reign of God. The only threat to God's kingdom is merely an internal one, a delay, perhaps, how long it will take for God's people to get on board. N.T. Wright once said that the whole point of the kingdom of God is Jesus has come to bear witness to the true truth, which is nonviolent. When God wants to take charge of the world, he doesn't send in the tanks. He sends in the poor and the meek. And Stanley Hauerwas has said that the church is constituted as a new people, who have been gathered from the nations to remind the world that we are, in fact, one people. Gathering, therefore, is an eschatological act, as it is the foretaste of the unity of the communion of the saints. Jesus' kingdom works differently than ours. And it works differently than my own personal kingdom. Because my kingdoms will fall, for they're built on sand. When we build our kingdoms upon the rock, they are built on something lasting that endures. Jesus is that rock. He sacrificed himself for our sake. And we have a lot to be grateful for just in that alone. But because of his sacrifice, we have been given new life. And that life ties us together as a community. It gives birth to us in love. And it gives us hope for a future that is not threatened, but enlivened by the Spirit of God. So this Thanksgiving and all days, as we celebrate this Christ the King Sunday, I invite you to consider which kingdom the actions you take are in league with. Are they God's kingdom actions? Or do they belong to the world? And to choose how you will act. Because choice is your right. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Thanksgiving meditation this morning as we introduce the offering. I'd like to ask Laura Hegner to come forward and read us something that she has written that was recently published. 